the vacuum cleaner salesman named Joe Bowers, who had dreamed up a terrific sales plan. Striding into a housewife's living room, without a word, he began to sprinkle dirt on her rug. Stop, she screamed. But Joe just kept on spreading dirt. Don't worry, lady, said Joe. Don't worry. Yes, but, lady, said Joe, when I get through demonstrating the super deluxe electric cleaner, I'll eat all the dirt that's left. What do you say to that? Well, I'm glad to know that, she said, because we have no electricity. Well, Joe's plan was daring and imaginative, an approach and demonstration all wrapped up in one. But his pre-approach, getting the information necessary to make his sales plan effective, drew a zero. In football, a successful coach always scouts the rival team carefully before the big game. By studying their strengths and weaknesses, he is able to plan an effective defense and offense. Without this information, he could be in for some unpleasant surprises. In selling, the objective of the pre-approach is the same, to plan an intelligent sales campaign. This means planning to show specific benefits to that particular prospect. Planning to appeal to his buying motives. Knowing in advance what may irritate this prospect. Knowing what pace of presentation will fit this prospect's mental tempo. Planning to handle the objections this prospect will probably raise. In short, a sales plan is an interview completely tailored for a particular prospect. Just as a football play is planned to go all the way against a certain opponent with nothing left to chance. Without a pre-approach, without knowing the prospect's ability to pay or who has the authority to buy, a salesman wastes his time on China eggs or blind alleys. The pre-approach is the first of the five stages of the sales interview, but let's get this straight. There are no definite, well-lighted steps in selling. It's more like a path to be followed. Your pre-approach may begin while you are still prospecting and continue right into your approach to the prospect. For instance, Harold Wells found out from a customer that his friend had the need and the financial ability to satisfy that need. He also had no commitments, such as a relative in the automobile business. All this qualified him as a prospect. In the same conversation, he moved into the pre-approach stages. He continued his pre-approach by digging up more facts about Kimball. On his approach, he checked the facts he had by a few questions and by observations of his prospects' reactions, ready up to the last minute to adjust his sales plan to any new facts that might appear. Here's Ted Sanders, successful salesman of industrial lubricants. Ted, would you tell us something about your pre-approach methods? Glad to. Pre-approach takes the biggest part of my time in most of my sales. The best example is a sale I made to one of the largest manufacturing plants in this area, the Kelsey Corporation. Their purchasing agent had given me the polite brush off time after time. He seemed completely sold on the deal he already had. But one day, a competitive salesman I knew began crying the blues about this same purchasing agent, said he was a price shopper, period that they were using inferior lubricants. There wasn't even a chance of selling a better lubricant, he said, because the plant engineer was a personal friend of the salesman for the lubricants they use now. Not too promising, but it got me thinking. I figured that if I had better products, I should be able to prove their worth, and if I could do that, price and even personal connections could be linked. But how? Kelsey is a big outfit, so it wasn't too hard to get the name of one of their key maintenance men through a customer of mine who had been trying to hire him for some time. I called on this fellow at his home and explained that I knew his reputation as a top flight maintenance man and I wanted his advice. He liked that. He told me their troubles. All plants have them, you know. Not enough choice of special lubricants, too much machine downtime for lubricating and repair, and not enough technical help with their problems. Then he described their setup in the plant operating group from the vice president in charge of operations, through the chief engineer, plant engineer, methods engineer, to his boss, the maintenance superintendent. On the other side was the factory superintendent, the production control superintendent, and the purchasing agent. Quite a group of people, any one of whom could prove a stumbling block. 
I asked my new friend for a chance to visit his, his boss. And on the scene, I had a chance to discuss their troubles. They agreed that centralized lubrication using a good product would really solve their punch press problem. We worked out a rough estimate of savings in man hours, machine idle time, and repair bills that would more than pay for the installation and the extra cost of lubricants. That was just one area. By the time I was done, I had a whole list of problems for our technical engineer to work on, and I had the maintenance superintendent fired up with the idea of licking his troubles. But he said, I'll never sell this to the plant group. It'll never get past the chief engineer. I told him that was my worry. All I wanted was his support if I could get a plan before them. And then I asked him a few questions about each of the members of the plant group. Back at the office, I got our technical engineer on the job and started mapping out my campaign. Looking over the notes I had collected on the plant group, I checked off the maintenance superintendent and went to work on the rest. The plant engineer and purchasing agent, I figured for a negative, but hoped for a good enough plan to get a majority approval. The methods engineer would go along with whatever the chief engineer said. The chief was a kind of crusty old gent in a sort of honorary position, but with positive and overriding ideas. He was an important question mark. The vice president in charge of operations had a keen mind. He bought on merits, not personality. The factory superintendent generally kept his hands off engineering and maintenance problems, but he was seriously concerned with rising costs of operations. The production control superintendent was in the same boat. Only his special problems were unexpected breakdowns and a rising rate of rejects. It looked as though a plan that would solve all their problems would sell, if I could get a chance to demonstrate it. I went to work picking up all the personal information I could about each of the group. But I kept coming back to the big question mark, the chief engineer. He was too dangerous to take a chance on. I went back to the maintenance superintendent and asked him for any personal items he could dig up on the chief engineer. Finally, he mentioned that the chief's grandson, John McClure II, was quite a track star in the local high school. I got a copy of the high school paper and read about the track meets and what John had done in them. Next day, I showed up at the high school athletic field and located young John. John not only told me his granddad was proud of him, but had been quite a track star himself and still had a keen interest in it. That was the little extra I needed. I got my plan all wrapped up in a tight bundle. Then I made my approach, direct to the chief engineer, mentioned my conversations with the maintenance superintendent, and that he had suggested I see him. He was a bit frosty until I slid over to young John's exploits and how proud he was of his grandfather. Well, I won't take time to tell you my approach and the rest of the sale, but I got my chance to present the plan to the plant group, and they liked it because it was tailored to their problems. As a result, Kelsey signed the biggest contract for lubricants I've ever landed. Thanks, Tad. You certainly did a beautiful job. Well, fellows, your pre-approach problems may never be as complicated as Ted's, but you can see now that there is a direct ratio between the amount of pre-approach effort required and the financial rewards of any sale. Ted earned his sale because he planned it by finding out how his prospect could best use his proposition, by determining that it would actually save them money, and by learning who had the authority to approve his plan. Then he studied the group he had to sell and tailored his sales plan to fit their ideas and their personalities. He used every source at his disposal to make his pre-approach effective. A fellow salesman, a customer, personal investigation, his office staff, and his own plain common sense. He sold his plan because he was ready to sell, because a good pre-approach gave him the confidence and enthusiasm to sell with conviction.